your microphone, please. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, so not making any money after this. Muhammad hasn't paid me yet. Still waiting on that. The uh, uh, introduction is really kind of an unusual introduction. I'm going to start by saying you guys have heard many, many times about transverse myelitis. If you look at the data, the transverse myelitis diagnoses are often questioned, especially those that don't improve, and many of them are actually incorrectly diagnosed. Uh, this can be reported anywhere between 15 up to 40 or 50 percent. So keep an eye out when you see transverse myelitis. Of course, many alternative diagnoses are identified, and uh, vascular etiologies are very common. So uh, today we're going to spend some time talking about vascular etiologies. It's, um, um, we're going to talk about them because they're very time sensitive and because treatment for transverse myelitis in general may actually worsen the pathology of the vascular etiology. So let's spend some time talking about them. Uh, some clinical features are going to suggest some vascular etiologies. We'll discuss this. We'll discuss acute myelopathy. We'll discuss chronic myelopathy. And we'll discuss some key uh, neuroimaging uh, findings, which will help in the diagnosis and treatment. So I'll try to stay on time. Uh, whenever we think about vascular myelopathies in general, I want you guys to divide them into essentially four big categories. And today, we're going to spend some time talking about each one. We're going to talk about arterial ischemia to the spinal cord. We'll talk about venous ischemia or venous infarctions. We'll talk about hematomyelia, which is essentially the equivalent of intracerebral hemorrhage. This is intraspinal hemorrhage. And then we'll talk about extraparenchymal hemorrhage of the spine. So ischemia and hemorrhage, ischemia arterial or venous, or hemorrhage within the spine or outside of the spine. I'm just leaving this out there for you guys. Uh, I'm sending the slides to Dr. Muhammad. Um, these are available. This is a protocol which is identified by the continuum article, which I'm using as a sole or the most important reference for this, uh, uh, this presentation. It talks about how to approach acute myelopathy, which they define, as you can see, uh, myelopathy developing within one day or 24 hours. Um, and they talk about airway breathing circulation. If you're suspecting trauma, activate trauma protocol. If you're suspecting aortic dissection, get a CT angiogram. And then if you're suspecting emergent cord compression or clots, we're gonna be focusing mostly on these, how to use MR imaging, lumbar punctures, and things like this to uh, perform a diagnosis. So uh, not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I think this is important for you guys to aware of. So, uh, before we talk about abnormal, we should talk about normal. And uh, uh, vascular anatomy of the spinal cord is slightly less um, reviewed compared to intracranial anatomy. So I think I'm going to spend a few minutes with pictures uh, talking about this. So if you guys remember, the spinal cord has two major sets of arteries. There's the anterior spinal artery, which in, in this diagram is shown here. And in this diagram is shown anteriorly. Obviously, this is sagittal, this is corona. Um, and there is the posterior spinal arteries. There's two of them, um, one on each side. The anterior spinal is often formed by branches from the vertebral arteries, although sometimes it can be formed by branches from pica. And the posterior uh, spinal arteries are also formed by branches from pica, but rarely they can be formed from uh, ventral branches of the uh, um, or branches of the uh, vertebral arteries. So if you guys remember, these arteries essentially head all the way down and the posterior spinal arteries are continuous the entire way through. Anterior spinal, not so much. It kind of thins out towards the bottom of the thoracic area uh, or kind of the middle of the thoracic area. And we call this a watershed area. And a lot of people will get ischemia to this location when they have severe hypotension. We'll, we'll address that as we go. Um, and the, the story behind these vessels is that they may form up in the top of in the, in the brain, but as they go, they get what we call feeder vessels. So the feeder vessels can come from vertebral arteries. They can come from subclavian feeders, cervical arteries. They can come from intercostal arteries. These are very, very common. Uh, people understand the artery of Adam Kavich, which is a radiculomedullary artery, usually between T9 and maybe L1 or something like that. Um, in this diagram shown at T10. And then all the way down to the, to the lumbar spine, where you can see some coming from the iliac arteries, 
lumbar arteries, hypogastric arteries. So this is a system which has a lot of feeding vessels. And a lot of the spinal arteries also receive feeders from paraspinal muscles, the muscles that are around the, the spinal um, the vertebral column. And so it's a very redundant system. It's a system that has a lot of collateral circulation. Well, this is clear in clinical practice. I mean, we don't see cord ischemia nearly as often as we see intracranial ischemia. Uh, the system is kind of very well protected and it's designed to be that way. Uh, these are an, this is another image. I think these images are really good because they help you understand um, the anatomy and the words that I'm going to be using today. So maybe if we start on the left of the screen, this is the aorta. This is the descending thoracic aorta. You can see intercostal arteries and they divide into dorsal and ventral branches. Um, sometimes there's a spinal branch. Sometimes the spinal branch comes from the dorsal branch. So please understand each image is a little bit different, as you can see here, for example because the anatomy is different in different people. Um, importantly, the spinal branch goes in. It usually enters through the neuroforamina of the, um, of, the, of the spinal column. It enters and it divides into an anterior radicular artery and a posterior radicular artery. Now, the radicular artery essentially supplies, brain, um, it supplies the nerve roots, but it does supply dura and it supplies bone. You will see in some cases, these are referred to as radiculomedullary arteries, and radiculomedullary arteries supply the actual spinal cord in addition to supplying part of the door. So they're branches of each other. The anatomy is really different in different people, but this is kind of another image to show you. I have a couple more uh, just to understand them. So again, on the left, really zooming in on the spinal cord, you can see this is the spinal branch that was labeled in the previous image. Um, this is from Frank Netter, uh, and as you enter, they call it anterior segmental medullary artery. Remember, this was called the radicular artery in the previous one. And then as it enters, it supplies part of the anterior spinal. Now, if you notice on this side, they call them anterior and posterior radicular arteries because in this diagram, according to Frank Netter, the radicular arteries do not contribute to the anterior spinal, but the segmental medullary ones do. Okay, you'll notice this is the, another segmental medullary. Same thing with the posterior spinal arteries. So I think what's important to understand is that you have the aorta. The aorta sends these uh, intercostal branches. And from the intercostal branches, specifically from the dorsal, as you can see here, you get these branches called segmental and medullary arteries that enter and they supply the uh, anterior spinal artery. There's a really big one around C3. There's a really big one around C10. And then there's a really, really important one by about T9 or T10, and we call it Adam Kavich, and that's kind of the big one um, for the spinal cord. Now, we always talk about arteries, but we rarely discuss veins. I just caution you that this image is slightly flipped. So if you notice, posterior is labeled in the back even though the actual anatomy points to the front. Uh, so this is an inappropriate image, but I actually could not find a very good image of venous structures um, inside, the, um, inside the spinal cord. Um, and you can see here the veins actually form these radial distributions. So they exit from the center, outside. They drain into these radicular veins, posterior and anterior radicular veins. And then from this drainage, they start entering into the vertebral venous plexus, and then into the external venous plexus. So um, relatively complex structure. This is very different from person to person, um, but it generally follows interior, radially outside. They gather at the nerve roots, they go into the dura, and then they exit from the dura into the internal vertebral and then the external vertebral plexus. So keep this in mind, slightly challenging anatomy, but we'll kind of discuss it as we go on. So again, Remember, we discussed the, the, the classification of vascular myelopathies, arterial, venous, hematomyelia, and extraparenchymal hemorrhage. So we're just going to spend some time talking about them one at a time. Let's start with arterial. So when you think of arterial vascular myelopathies, I want you guys to think about three major things. Periprocedural cord ischemia or infarction. This is very common, right? I mean, it's not super common, but we commonly encounter this compared to the other vascular myelopathies. There is spontaneous cord infarction. This is the equivalent of ischemic stroke in the brain. Uh, 
and then there is spontaneous cord TIAs, which is basically an infarction that the person had resolution. Again, very similar to TIAs. TIAs of the spinal cord are extremely rare. They're very difficult to prove, so I'm not gonna spend time talking about them. I'm just gonna talk about the first two, and I think you can forgive me. This is not really very important. So let's focus on periprocedural cord ischemia. Um, mainly, this is described, if you're doing a board exam, this is described mostly with thoracic aortic aneurysm repair. So if you have a descending aortic aneurysm, whether you repair it with open surgery or endovascular surgery, you really risk developing this um, cord ischemia. And that's really related to the artery of Adam Kavich and the decreased blood supply. But this is not the only surgery that this has been described. There's all sorts of different types of surgeries. There's surgeries focused on spinal procedures like surgical decompressions, if somebody's doing nerve blocks, if somebody's doing epidural injections and they get really close, they can actually injure those vessels or actually occlude them by mass effect of what they're injecting, then cause cord ischemia. This is exceptionally rare, obviously. Uh, vascular procedures, even simple angiography in rare cases can cause spinal cord ischemia or outright vascular surgery. I think we understand that from the top. And then major surgeries like cardiac surgery, thoracic surgery, all of these have been described in case reports you need to kind of result in this ischemia. So most patients wake up from surgery and they have these maximal symptoms that they've developed. But some patients, it takes them hours to days sometimes after waking up to develop the symptoms. So keep in mind, to ask about if somebody's had surgery in the past two or three days, maybe even up to a week, and use this as part of your differential diagnosis. Now, key element here is that pain is actually less common in periprocedural cord ischemia, specifically when it's compared to spontaneous ischemia, so non-surgery. And this is gonna tell us a lot about the mechanism of, of injury to the spinal cord. So remember, Tons of surgery, they wake up with symptoms, and then they go away. So uh, we need to understand it's extremely important to diagnose this early and begin treatment. And the idea behind treatment is you need to increase spinal cord perfusion through collateral circulation, right? We spent time talking about how the blood supply is all over the place. It may be difficult to understand, but it's good to levy this, to leverage the blood vessels in order to supply this. So how do we increase perfusion? Just like simple fluid dynamics, simple physics, if you increase pressure or you decrease resistance, you're going to increase flow. Now, this is very simple physics. So how do we decrease pressure? So you can decrease intrathecal pressure by doing CSF drainage. So the neurosurgeons, or you if you want, you can place a CSF drain, and typically the recommended rate of drainage is about 10 cc's every two to four hours. And this is usually continued for about one to two days. You can either do this, but while you do this, you should make sure that you target pressures between eight and 12. It's really, it becomes concerning to go below eight because it's hard to control your lower limit and you don't wanna over drain um, your CSF. So CSF puncture, lumbar puncture, then you put the drain in. The other thing that we do is we augment the map. We increase the map. We target maps above 90. You can use fluids to do this, or you can use pressors, for example, uh, phenylephrine, and that will help augment the blood pressure and hopefully augment perfusion into the spinal cord. Um, and this is really important. This has been described really well in the literature in terms of preventative measures, but the treatment has not had a very clear effect. As you can imagine, this is really rare and difficult to study. Uh, but so again, the, what are the risk of these treatments? You can guys see here a contraction, which is known as the lumbar drain. You can overdrain them and that, you know, that can cause sagging and compression of the nerve roots and stuff like that. So try not to do that. Um, or for example, if you augment blood pressure and the person has a dissection in one of their vessels, you could potentially worsen the dissection. So you always got to keep that in mind and understand the physiology behind the, the injury before you make the decision. Um, most patients, the good news is most patients have either moderate or significant improvement over time. So we think, you know, spinal cord infarction or whatever done, but actually a lot of these patients improve over time and many of them walk into clinic. Um, but what are kind of the risk factors for bad outcomes? So advanced age, uh, 
if you have a big lesion on MRI scan, if you present with flaccid areflexia, or you have an absent Babinski signs. These have all been independently associated with a worsened outcome after periprocedural leukemia. Um, so if we, if we park surgery on the side for a minute and we go to spontaneous. So what if somebody has no surgery? Spontaneous cord infarction represents about 1% of all stroke. And we think when people come to the hospital and they get a workup and they get a diagnosis of transverse myelitis, there are clear retrospective series that show that about 15% of those actually have cord infarction, not transverse myelitis. Now, a lot of the times this is associated with typical vascular risk factors, any hypertension, diabetes, atherosclerosis, hyperlipidemia, obesity, everything that, that our population likes to do, um, but it can actually occur at any age. And I can assure you, you know, we see kids with this, we see people who are much older, so it can really happen at any time. Um, uh, the symptoms essentially correspond to an arterial distribution, and this makes sense, right? You're talking about arterial ischemia, so arterial occlusion. If you have, for example, anterior spinal artery occlusion, you get bilateral weakness and bilateral pain and temperature loss because this supplies the anterior two-thirds of the spinal cord. If you have posterior spinal artery occlusion, you generally get loss of vibration and proprioception on that side, um, and that's important. Remember, the crossing happens much higher for the posterior columns. It happens at the level of the uh, cervical medullary junction, and, and it you know continues into the midbrain and the brainstem. Um, so this is ipsilateral loss of vibration and proprioception. There have been syndromes where it's like full cord, central cord, hemicord, like brown saccard syndrome. They've all technically been described in arterial ischemia. And this really has to do with the variable blood supply. But I just want you guys to think about this. And I think this is you know, very relevant to, to our practice and to anatomy. Um, a lot of these guys come with pain. So they come with back pain, sometimes chest pain or neck pain, or even limb pain. And this makes us understand that the physiology for ischemia spontaneously is often associated with dissection or fibrocartilaginous emboli. So, so um, uh, a collection of fibrin, it kind of breaks off of these vessels and it goes into other vessels. And because it's hard, it can actually start to tear the inside of these blood vessels. Sometimes these are supplied by nerve roots coming out from the cord and it's, it's quite painful. So it's important to keep in mind, if somebody comes in, they have acute myelopathy and they're in pain, you have to think of spinal cord ischemia. This is top differential until proven otherwise because the treatment is acute. In the history and on exams, it's usually gonna be precipitated by a physical maneuver, lifting, hyperextension of the cord, neck movements, that salva. This is important because it, again, it tells you about the mechanism. Sometimes it can be disc herniation, which compresses one of those radicular branches. Sometimes it can be an injury to one of the branches. Um, keep that in mind. Somebody who's been at the gym comes in with myelopathy, think of cord infarction. So, of course, we can't do neurology without doing images. Uh, so here's a, um, a diagram, again, from Continuum. And I'll just point out some, some of the uh, axial changes that you can see here. This is actually a T2 hyperintense change. And you can see it here, and you can see it on the sagittal. You can see all the different patterns that people with ischemia can present with. And you know, if you go really low into the lumbar or even high into the cervical, you can see all sorts of changes that happen with ischemia. Now, I have here put them in sort of phases. And if you're really astute, you will notice there is not a single DWI image. And that's because although you can see DWI changes and ADC correspondent changes, the sensitivity for these images are, are, is not really great. And it's not great because the technical difficulty of imaging the cord with DWI. I mean, the guys in radiology need to do a better job with the physics. They need to figure this out. This is just a bad image. Um, and because of this, because the images are bad, and because it can take time for flare or T2 to change, a lot of the times in acute cord ischemia, you're going to have a normal image. And you usually use, just like in the beginning, you know, when we teach medical students, you do a head CT in the brain for a stroke to rule out hemorrhage. Uh, 
you're essentially doing an MRI acutely to rule out compression. And that's going to be the big differential, right? So if you don't see compression and a person has myelopathic changes that you, you know, have like a sensory level or, or you have bilateral weakness, you have to be, you know, various to, you have to think this is spinal cord infarction, even with a normal MRI scan, even with a normal MRI scan. Subacutely, if you wait maybe a couple of days, you'll really start to see all of these nice T2 changes. Sometimes you can even see vertebral body infarction, and that's because, again, those radicular arteries, they can supply some of the bone. You will see enhancement with contrast, and people think, oh, look, enhancement, this is transverse myelitis. Very often ischemia enhances subacutely, right? This is true in the brain, this is true in the spinal cord, this is true in many places of the body. You disrupt the barrier, the natural barrier between the organ and the blood vessel, and that's why you get enhancement. Chronically, you obviously will get myelomyelia, so you will get kind of this like atrophic changes that start to take place over time because you just had an ischemic injury. And I think this is pretty obvious. So um, when people come and they have spinal cord infarctions, people may not recognize that. You guys will see this in your residency. I guarantee you it will not be recognized initially. Many people will think this is Guillain-Barre syndrome. Many people will think this is a peripheral process. Many people, again, will think this is transverse myelitis. So what are they going to do? If they think it's Guillain-Barre, they're going to tap and do an EMG, right? It's not uncommon to find abnormal EMG changes at the level of the ischemia. It makes sense. You're affecting those, you know, motor neurons that are coming out, those anterior horn cells. And it's not, you know, people don't like that. Your, your muscles are going to pick that up and you're going to pick that up. Um, Hamad Hatu will pick that up on EMG. Um, CSF. Sometimes you're going to see mild protein elevation. And unfortunately, people start saying, oh, look at the protein. This is albuminocytologic dissociation. Again, you got to keep this in mind, the acuity of the onset, the, the sensory level. You got to think about that. Um, you can see elevated WBCs. You can see them in stroke, by the way. Um, but you typically don't see them more than 25 per high power field. If it's more than 25, then you start thinking infection or inflammation or, or put the differential. So what other mechanisms or what are some of the mechanisms of spontaneous non-surgical um, uh, infarctions of the spinal cord? There's dissection. This can be vertebral dissection. This can be aortic dissection. This can be any kind of dissection, and that explains a lot of the pain. So again, fibrocartinogenous embolism. We talked about compression of the radicular artery by discs. Vasculitis has been described to cause um, infarction of the spinal cord. You have to think, I'm saying primary CNS angiitis, which is already very rare. And then this is not causing brain strokes. This is causing spinal cord strokes. It's even rare, right? So, you know, I'm really nit nitty gritty here. Um, obviously, hypercoagulability has been described. And then there's other rare mechanisms and syndromes. I've kind of listed them. You don't have to know them. But um, a lot of stroke in the spinal cord still remains unidentified, just like it does in the brain. So some mechanisms to kind of think about. Now, so what do we what do we do? do? We give TPA, right? That's the big question. I mean, this is this is still the one wonder drug that we still have that sometimes works and sometimes is a little bit disappointing. Uh, but the answer is you should definitely consider giving TPA. And it's basically very similar physiology to the brain. So if you're within four and a half hours, the four and a half hour window clearly comes from the brain, even though we think spinal cords are actually less sensitive to ischemia. So your window is probably longer, but it is very reasonable to consider TPA within the four and a half hour window. We talked about MAP augmentation and CSF drainage. And of course you do secondary prevention if you do not find a clear mechanism or you suspect this is atherosclerosis, some people have used dual antiplatelets. You know, you essentially almost treat it like an ischemic stroke and, uh, and you work it up. So uh, what happens to them? So they, they do okay. Surprisingly, they do okay. Um, they're not perfect, but about half of these patients will actually walk without assistance, which is a really important thing. So this guy's walking with a cane. Um, he's uh, probably in the second half of his life. Uh, but a lot of these guys walk without a cane, with a cane, with some help, but many of them will walk. Now, unfortunately, they complain of neuropathic pain and neurogenic bladder. And these, they may not seem like much to us because we've been programmed 
based on the MRS and based on all sorts of things to think of motor disability as disability, but all of these things can be disabling. Neuropathic pain, neurogenic bladder. I really recommend you follow them up with urology for their bladder and be relatively aggressive with their neuropathic pain. You know, now nobody wants to prescribe gabapentin, but get them on duloxetine, get them on TCAs. They may need nerve blocks if it's clearly ridiculous pain. So, you know, be, be, be aggressive with these guys. It can actually improve their life significantly. Recurrence is extremely rare. I've never seen it happen. It's possible, I guess. There's been case reports, but it's extremely rare. So I think that covers our material. Like I said, IAs, we're not going to discuss. form after trauma. This is the same like in the face. You get carotid cavernous fistulas. Um, we, we do surgery to create fistulas for dialysis. So fistulas are typically iatrogenic or trauma. And, and you have to think about that when the history suggests it. Um, they typically form, this is important, between the radiculomeningeal arteries and the radicular veins. So if you remember that diagram, it's that branch that initially goes in, followed by the branch that's coming out. And what happens is when the artery and the vein are touching each other, there is no normal capillary bed in between them. There's actually no capillary bed. The pressure within the artery starts building up this pressure within the vein, and it causes this arterialization of the vein. The vein starts looking like an artery. It thickens, it doesn't pulsate as well. And unfortunately, this causes this venous hypertension or venous congestion which results in bad drainage and ischemia of the cord. And that's the mechanism in dural AV fistulas. So you can see here, actually, and we'll talk about this, um, you can see some changes um, if you really hallucinate on the T2. Look, uh, do, do what our good friends in radiology do. do use a mind-altering substance, hallucinate really well. You can see flow voids that are happening here around the spinal cord. And these flow voids actually represent an AV fistula. You can also see the crazy, you know, T2 hyperintense lesion that's happening in the cord. Um, so I think it's pretty obvious. And we'll talk about the neuroimaging in just a minute. So how do they present? So the arterial people we talked about, they present acutely, you know, within a day. These guys typically present also with pain, but their symptoms are progressive. They do not happen acutely. It can take days to weeks of worsening symptoms. There's been cases of months of worsening symptoms. They can get leg weakness. Again, they can get bowel or bladder symptoms. What's really tricky about venous changes of the spinal cord, because of the weird anatomy of the blood vessels, you can actually affect the nerve roots sometimes more than the actual corticospinal tract. So interestingly, you get more lower motor neurons than upper motor neuron sites. This is very important because people immediately assume this is Guillain-Barre syndrome, and then they treat for Guillain-Barre syndrome. And the problem with this, the problem with this is part of the workup for Guillain-Barre syndrome is a lumbar puncture. And if you guys remember, when we wanted to treat arterial ischemia, and we wanted to increase perfusion into the spine, we did a, an LP or a CSF drain so that we bring in more blood. What happens in AVFs is there's already too much blood in the veins. So if you do an LP, you think this is, you know, you're gray, you're like, ah, oh, it's Guillain-Barre syndrome, I'm just gonna tap, start them on IVIG. If you, if you tap, you're actually gonna worsen the venous pressure and you're gonna worsen the problem. It also worsens with Valsalva, it worsens with exertion. So keep this in mind when you're thinking about venous occlusions. Always look for a sensory level, always look for bowel and bladder, and you may, if you have a suspicion, image the cord first. The person with Guillain-Barre can wait for a couple of hours until you do it. 
Now, if you think this is transverse myelitis, when you see something on the MRI, remember, when you give people steroids, not really standard for transverse myelitis, it increases your fluid retention, it increases your intravascular volume, and this can become, you know, bad, again, for your venous engorgement. Now, rarely, very rarely, you do an MRI and you see a dural AV fistula and it's incidental, it's not causing any problems. It has been reported, it is rare, but typically, if you see it, it's not behaving too well, it's bad. Something going on, gotta talk about it. Okay, so here's, as promised, here's a neuroimaging. This is kind of a different image because I just want you guys to see uh, all sorts of stuff that you're seeing. The key features here is, uh, first things first, hyperintensity of the cord. Look at this, I mean, this cord has enough hyperintensity for the entire neurology service, صح? And a lot of the time, it's a very big lesion, all, almost always crosses like three vertebral, you know, kind of like NMO, but obviously different. And here's me talking about transverse of my lines. A lot of the times it goes down to the conus. Because of the vascular anatomy, the conus tends to be very affected with venous infarctions, and it explains a lot of those lower motor neuron symptoms like we talked about. You can see flow voids. I don't think I need to show this to you. I mean, they're very clear, the flow voids. And you can actually see enhancement with contrast. I believe this is a T1 post. I mean, check me on that. And you can see enhancement. This is not an inflammatory process. This is venous congestion causing leakage of contrast because you're disturbing the blood spinal cord barrier. If you do a digital subtraction angiography, you can and you will see dural AV fistulas. But sometimes the flow in the veins is so slow because of the engorgement, they actually thrombose. When they thrombose, or if they're momentarily compressed by hyperextension or abnormal positioning, the, the contrast doesn't get into the vessels and you think it's a normal angiogram. So just make sure that you get an MRI and you're suspicious um, you know, before you order the DSA. So what do we do about them? How do we fix them? If you find them, you gotta treat them. They're like I said, they're bad. They're not great. If you're, you know, if Dr. Ayman is in there, he's got his little catheter in there. Um, he can embolize them. They have this uh, really cool substance called Onyx. Now they mix it like this in the in the in the in the Andrew suite. If you see them, they have like a little machine that shakes it for them. Or if the machine's not working, one of the nurses has to do it. And then they they inject it and they they mix it with contrast. So when they inject, they can see it with contrast. It's radiolucent, so they can't see it, so they have to mix the contrast with it. And then they go and they occlude kind of the venous aspect of the fistula. And once they do that, the entire fistula just doesn't work anymore because the problem is in the veins, right? So if you occlude the veins, everybody's happy. It works pretty good. If you're more experienced, you end up on the 80% or higher. If you're less experienced, if I'm doing it, I'm hitting 20, 30%, so it depends. Um, but you know, if your catheter is already in there, might as well do it. Um, but surgery, where they do is they kind of disconnect the draining vein, is extremely effective in this case. And of course, if you can't fix it with DSA, then go and fix it with surgery. How do these people do long-term? About half of them improve, and about a third of them stabilize. So it's still really good prognosis compared to many things that we see. Um, if you look maybe within a couple of months, sometimes you can still see enhancement and you can still see hyperintensity on T2, but the flow voids should be gone. If you still see flow voids, that means that there was a treatment failure and you have to reconsult them for uh, you know, further treatment for this patient. You're not supposed to see flow voids. You can see contrast, but you can't see flow voids. Um, we said in venous pathology, the most common is dural AV fistula in the dura. But sometimes there are fistulas outside of the dura, epidural, and inside of the dura, specifically within the pia. So epidural AV fistulas, they don't form from radicular arteries. They form from paraspinal or paravertebral arteries, and they connect directly to the epidural venous plexus. You're like, ah, who cares? They're not that different. I mean, they can be. And the reason is they actually cause sometimes only nerve root compression on the outside. Remember, they're not inside. They're not in the dura. They're outside of the dura. So they catch those nerves as they're coming out and they compress them. And then again, somebody's calling Dr. Hatu to look for the radiculopathy. Okay, so got to keep this in mind. It's rare. It is rare, but it is a differential of mono radiculopathy. 
sometimes even polyradiculopathy. Now, I've included here something called osseous versus non-osseous. This is for the vascular nerds in the group. Um, if the arteries are supplying some of the bone, the bone itself can infarct and it bulges, and it's actually the bone that's compressing the nerve roots. Non-osseous involves the artery a little bit more distally after it's already given its osseous branches, and it doesn't involve the bone, but it can compress the spinal cord or the nerve roots. So just to quickly remember, osseous compresses nerve roots a little more. Non-osseous really causes a bit more of a myelopathy. These, unlike dural AV fistulas, generally happen in the C-spine and the upper T-spine. So dural AV fistulas, they can happen anywhere, but you see a lot of their effects at the bottom of the cord. These, you see a lot of the effects at the higher side of the cord. So keep these in mind. Um, PLAV fistulas, they form between spinal cord arteries and veins. If you remember, these are the kind of arteries that like literally entered into the spinal cord, like the branches from the anterior spinal, branches from the radiculomedullary arteries. They connect to those radial veins that are draining. This is very rare, very, very rare. But when they do happen, they like to happen just in front of the conus for some reason. And they present with progressive myelopathy or they bleed. They cause hematomyelia or they cause um, extra dual. We're going to talk about them as electricals. But keep them in mind. They're there. They're rare. You may never see them. But, you know, part of the differential, keep it in mind. Um, other causes of venous ischemia are something like Bassett disease. So Bassett disease, what people here like to call Bajet disease, is um, uh, obviously a vasculitis which has a lot of venous involvement in addition to the ulcers and things like that. And it's obviously neurobacets has been described. There's demyelinating lesions that can happen with it, sometimes even infarctions. But in the cord, it can cause venous infarction. Um, you can have a prothrombotic state. You can have pelvic vein thrombosis, like a really bad DVT. COVID certainly doesn't help with that. And you can get cord ischemia from backup pressure. You can have cancer, hypercoagulable. You can get sepsis and hyperthrombosis from that. You can get an epidural infection, and that can cause problems. Or you can get decreased vena cava drainage. Remember, again, the idea is the veins are not draining blood. So if your vena cava, for some reason, is thrombosed, there is mediastinitis, there is extremely severe heart failure and very low central venous pressure, there is congenital obstruction, you can get venous um, disease of the spinal cord. So I know there's a lot of information. You don't have to know all of it in detail, but just kind of keep it in mind to, to get a working differential in your head uh, when you see these cases. Third category, let me see how we're doing on time. Well, not too bad. Um, third category is uh, hematomyelia, which is essentially bleeding, as you can see, directly into the cord. Here you're seeing one of the posterior spinals. So directly into the cord, we're seeing some bleeding. Not great, right? So um, this is essentially hemorrhage directly into the spinal cord. It is rare. I'm not going to lie. It is rare. Usually happens with trauma, but when it's non-traumatic, it happens with cavernous malformations, cav mals, or arteriovenous fistulas, or malformations. Similar presentation to spinal cord infarct but it usually is slower. It takes a little bit more time because you're affecting the spinal cord in the parenchyma itself, but it's a bleed, so it takes time to kind of expand a little bit. So we're going to focus on the non-traumatic side of it, so cavernous malformations. Um, spinal cord cavernous malformations make up 5% of all cavernous malformations. Now, if a person has a cav mal in their brain, their chances of having a cav mal in their spinal cord is like 1% or maybe 5%, depending on where you look. But if they have a cav mal in their cord, there's almost a 25% chance that they also have a cav mal in their brain. So you may need to scan that, okay? I copied the definition from the uh, um, continuum article, a cluster of tightly packed dilated sinusoidal veins with no interfering intervening parenchyma and no feeding artery or draining vein. It just means it's a bunch of veins stuck together. There's no artery going in and no vein coming out. They're just sitting there and there's no, there's no neurons in them. It's just bad vessels, okay? These are men in their 30s. These are people like me that will have cav mouths, okay? Um, of course, they're congenital, but 
when they're not congenital related to trauma or related to radiation, the people in my age are kind of the more common to have it. Okay, there's a family history in about 10% of them, but if somebody has a lot of cavernous malformations, it ends up being about 50% of people have a family history. So keep that in mind as you look. Um, typically are asymptomatic, unless they're really big and they cause mass effect, but most of the time they don't do anything until they rupture, until they bleed. Once they bleed, patients tend to come in. Now, the risk of bleeding is about 1% to 5% annually, but if you have a real big one, especially when that's blood before, so more than a centimeter, the chances of bleeding are about 10%. When they bleed, they tend to come with a lot of pain. And sometimes patients present with pain, even though they haven't bled yet. It's just, a, they're, just a, they're just kind of an annoying bunch of vessels and they cause problems if they're big. So if they're not so big, they're not bad. Um, if you guys like the USMLE and you like uh, board exams, now we're going to have the Qatari board exam, which is going to be relatively similar to the USMLE. Everybody likes what we call keywords or buzzwords. The buzzword for cavernous malformations is popcorn appearance. I don't think the people that called it have really seen good popcorn, but this is what they call popcorn appearance, right? Um, it's a heterogeneous lesion, but usually, usually, I hope I can convince you, there's a T2 hypo intensity, which is surrounding it. This is actually um, essentially this, this blood products, which are around it. Now, if you see T1 hyper intensity around it, kind of like this a little bit, and you see some perilesional edema, you may convince yourself that there has been a previous hemorrhage, which has occurred in this cavernous malformation. So you gotta keep that in mind. Um, I got this, I thought this was slightly better popcorn, but you know, maybe this is the kind that people pay too much for, so they're not gonna eat it. If it's not causing problems, don't do anything about it. If they're asymptomatic, if they're stable, do not touch them. But if they're like this guy and it's huge, you may have to do something about them. Now, the criteria here is not for surgery, but these people tend to do the best when you do surgery. Remember, a lot of surgery has to do with patient selection sometimes more than skill. So of course, skill is important. But um, So if your symptoms are new, like if somebody's symptoms just started within about three months, if the lesion is big, or if they predominantly have motor neuron lesions, these people tend to do better. If they have a lot of pain or if they have a lot of sensory loss, for some reason, the surgery doesn't help as much. But if they have weakness, they tend to improve. Okay. Now, we may be getting a little bit technical here. This is kind of where I get real nerdy, so I'm gonna watch myself. Um, there's actually different types of AV malformations, and the spinal dural AVFs, the one that we just talked about in the venous section of the ischemia, is actually called type one. There are four other types. I have them all listed here. There's even subtypes of them, if anybody's curious. Um, but for the purpose of this discussion, for the purpose of the article, which is being used as the primary reference in continuum, we will refer to type two and type five, like the whole thing, type two as spinal AVMs, okay? Spinal AVMs. Even though they're technically different, sometimes they have different presentations. They're certainly treated a little bit differently, but we're just gonna clump them together because they're similar, even though they're not identical. Um, this is a diagram to help you guys understand a little bit the difference between an AVM and an AV fistula. Okay, an AVM has a nidus in it. Usually, it's a connection not directly from the artery to the vein, but from the arterioles to the venules. And this bypasses the capillaries and it creates this really nasty, nasty nidus. And the problem here is the nidus. So we'll treat it endovascularly, they have to occlude all of these feeder vessels in order to, or maybe they'll just occlude this one and this one, in order to make sure there is no flow in the snidus. The nidus is bad. These vessels are abnormal. They're not fun. That's why sometimes they can have aneurysms within them because the formation of these vessels is just crap, right? And this can happen over time. They bleed. They like to bleed. Fistulas are a connection directly between the artery and the vein. Now here, they're diagramming something called a venous pouch. You don't have to always have a venous pouch, but it's there. And as you can tell, the artery doesn't look abnormal. It's really the vein that looks abnormal. So when these guys are treating them, they have to fix the vein, and then the artery just kind of takes care of itself. So I thought this is a good idea, AVM, AVF, 
just gotta keep in mind. So uh, spinal AVMs, we're gonna talk about the left side now. Um, they're associated with spinal cord aneurysms. I said this. They're very rare. If you find an aneurysm and if you find an AVM in the brain, you need 10 of them to find one in the spinal cord. Very rare, okay? They do happen to 20s and 30s, but like most good things in the world, they do not discriminate between men and women. This is an equal opportunity disease. It can happen to anybody, okay? They are typically associated with genetic mutations and syndromes. I'm not going to go you know, through all of them, but there's things like hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. There's all sorts of syndromes that these guys are associated with. So when you do find a spinal AVM, you should think about it in the context of the syndrome. Okay, they present with bleeding, acute hematomyelia, resulting in myelopathy. Forgive the typo, excuse me. Um, it develops over days, and again, it is very similar to the other types of bleeding. Um, it is not as acute as arterial occlusions. It can be complicated by subarachnoid hemorrhage. Remember, it does have an aneurysm. It can cause cord compression. It can cause arachniditis. So. Um, all sorts of things that we have to keep in mind. The annual higher than those cavernous malformations, and it does have a 10% chance of recurrence. So, like always, we got to look at some of these um, some of these uh, uh, images, right? So, look here. Not all the images, by the way, are for AVMs. This is an AVM. You can see the AVM. You can see the flow void. You can see the flow voids here. The difference is, folks. In dural AV fistulas, the type ones, the flow voids are always outside of the, of the spinal cord. They're extramedullary, they're dural, right? These are intramedullary, some of them. You can see that they actually happen inside the spinal cord and this causes a lot of problems, right? And if they bleed, of course they bleed directly into the cord. Um, they can cause this accumulation of blood products you can look for acute hemorrhage. And with long-term disease, there's atrophy. Now here, this kind of takes you through another cavernous malformation and things like that. Um, so just kind of, you know, take a look at them when you have a chance. Um, but the, the image really that I wanted to focus on is here. Um, this is a digital subtraction angiography of a dural ABM in this case. You can see the nidus. Nasty, nasty, very ugly. And I sh actually, I think you can see some of the aneurysm. Um, um, this is associated with this, uh, very nasty, okay? And you can see them kind of entering into that radicular artery and injecting and watching that abnormal connection before they drain into the veins. You cannot see the venous drainage, except maybe a little bit here um, in this image. So the treatment for these is really complex. You really need a, a, a very um, experienced neurologist or neuroradiologist as a neurointerventionalist, I guess neurosurgeon too, uh, but you also need a very experienced vascular neurosurgeon. To, uh, to be able to fix these. You have options. You can endovascularly embolize this. You can surgically resect it, or you can do radio surgery. Um, the data is very little on all of these. I can tell you if there's a clear feeder vessel like this, a lot of people will just go through endovascular. If the location of the AVM is like very posterior or very posterolateral, very accessible by surgery, a lot of them will just go operate. Um, radio surgery kind of need anatomy that's not so they'll, it's a complex um, it's a complex case complex treatment and they kind of need to seek it like that I'm watching the time um, there are other causes of hematomyelia there is spinal cord aneurysm which can present with subarachnoid hemorrhage and it will have all the beautiful you know problems with subarachnoid hemorrhage if you have anticoagulation or a bleeding disorder intrasyringeal hemorrhage is if you have a syrinx and you actually end up bleeding into the syrinx you can have that, infections and post-infectious problems. So infections, uh, varicella, um, uh, HTLV, there's a lot of nasty stuff in the, in the cord. Uh, post-infectious, especially post-influenza, there uh, there's a syndrome called acute necrotizing hemorrhagic encephalitis. There's also a spinal um, version of this. Everybody was tweeting about this uh, when COVID came out. Um, there, you can get vasculitis, you can get radiation, so there's all sorts of stuff. Um, that can cause hematomyelia. Last but not least, in the last five minutes, we're gonna talk about extraparenchymal bleeds. So extraparenchymal bleeds, meaning bleeding outside of the actual cord itself, can either be, just like the brain, epidural, subdural, or subarachnoid. Epidural is by far, by far, the most common, okay? 
usually it happens because of surgery or because of epidural infection, injection, or a lumbar puncture, meaning iatrogenic, right? Iatrogenic. But it can rarely happen spontaneously, usually when people are on medication. Um, usually, again, develops hours to days after surgery. Again, they're surgical. And they present with motor deficits or like ridiculous intractable pain. Uh, there should be a parenthesis here. So ridiculous pain. Okay. If these happen immediately after surgery, remember, we talked about periprocedural spinal cord ischemia and the arterial section. You have to think about that first because that is a lot more common than epidural hemorrhage. You also have to think about direct cord trauma. The surgeon actually touched the cord in a way that injured the cord or there was an inadequate decompression, there's cage dislodgement, there's all sorts of things that can cause it. Sometimes people who have had a surgical decompression of their cord, like laminectomy and whatever, they get an MRI later and they find epidural hemorrhage and it's asymptomatic, don't touch it. It's there, people don't like it, it's okay. Because of how acutely it presents after surgery, many people end up getting a head CT first, especially because there's a lot of hardware in their back. You can see it on CT, but obviously MRI is more sensitive. Fix the coagulopathy if it's spontaneous, and if it's not, collect the underlying mechanism. Let's say there's an adequate decompression or something, go in and fix it. Um, if there's nothing happening, don't do anything, okay? Subdural. Trauma or iatrogenic, we really do things to our patients, right? If we give them anticoagulation or antiplatelets for a long period of time, this is a problem. This is one of the reasons why Dr. Sadat will not, not anticoagulate anybody with venous thrombosis. Um, a minor reason for that. Um, but really, I mean, if somebody doesn't need to be on anticoagulation, please take them off. Um, pain, progressive myelopathy, this is very common, right? You see this happen all the time. Uh, the management is similar to the epidural hematoma. So fix the problem, treat the, the bleeding diastasis, and just observe. Okay, last but not least, my favorite subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's rare. Does happen, but it's rare. Usually happens in the context of these aneurysms that are associated with the AVMs, okay? It's exactly like a subarachnoid in the head, but it's in the back. So it's literally worst back pain of your life, or neck pain, very bad pain super bad pain, you get meningismus, you can get headache if the blood spreads all the way up. I think actually Tahira had seen a case of this recently of somebody that had been going through CPR. Remember Tahira would call me and um, we looked at the CT scan. There was a nice pool of blood at the bottom of the CT scan, all in the subarachnoid space. And of course the head CT was read as normal. Um, and the patient was you know, fine, yeah, normal. Guy was intubated, couldn't move anything. Um, had a headache, they can get hyponatremia from uh, cerebral salt wasting or spinal salt wasting or from SIADH, so you gotta monitor the mechanism. Um, uh, it can cause complications from blood product redistribution, the most common is racial spasm. You can get elevated uh, pressure if you include the arachnoid granulations, all sorts of stuff. Um, typically, we do conservative management, just like we do the subarachnoid hemorrhage. We correct the underlying cause. If there's an aneurysm, it's gotta be fixed. And then we try to prevent vasospasm, try to prevent all sorts of problems that happen with it, sympathetic storming, um, you know, a lot of neurocritical care stuff. Uh, so conclusion, I'm, I'm finishing on time, surprisingly. Uh, so vascular myelopathy is uncommon. You're not gonna see this every day, but it's, but it's often undiagnosed, unfortunately. A lot of the times it's called transverse myelitis you have to have a high index of suspicion in order to pick it up. There's a lot of etiologies, but you can generally think of them in terms of ischemic and hemorrhagic, and from ischemic think arterial or venous, and hemorrhagic think hematomyelia, meaning intraparenchymal, and then extradural, extraparenchymal. Um, appropriately, um, you have to diagnose them early because treating them early with TPA, with MAP augmentation, with CSF drainage, with decompression is key to improving these outcomes. The longer you wait, the worse it is. So uh, I'm done, this is it, the, this, is a, this is a thank you picture. I'm gonna ask you guys if anybody can guess what city this is before we wrap up. New York? Not New York. It's very close to New York, about maybe a four-hour drive north of New York.
Michigan? Sorry. So Michigan? No. Michigan will be far, man. Mich uh, Michigan. I'll give you a clue. This is Harvard. This is Harvard University. So this is Boston. This is a picture of Boston. I'm putting Boston up. My brother lives in Boston. Uh, hopefully we're going to see him this summer.